today we have three fabulous gentlemen from uh, the uh, security and police force that uh, has been working here in Sheboygan County. Um, I'm going to lead into that by explaining that I don't know if you've gotten to see Sheboygan Press this morning, but this was perfectly timed. We have the man charged with homicide and the heroin overdose and the legislative committee okays the trio of heroin bills right on the front page. If you don't get a chance, if you haven't had a chance to read those two articles, they're timely. They're going to actually be dis discussed a little bit, touched on this morning. So if you would help me um, welcome the three gentlemen who are here to speak with us. We have Sheriff Todd Preby. He has been in the service for 23 years and three years, the last three years, as our sheriff. Um, Chief Domagowski has been in the service for 25 years. You're not even going to raise your hand. You're just going to pretend that I'm not talking about you. Good. Um, help me out here. <laughs> He's been in service for 25 years, and he has been our chief of police for the last four. And we have Chief Tauchek, who has been in the service for 34 years, and he has been seven years the chief of police in Plymouth. So if you give them a warm welcome, thank you. Welcome. Uh, thank you for allowing us to give a presentation to your group this afternoon. Hopefully everything will work all right with our uh, laptop. The person that set it up, just to break this open a little bit, said it, showed us how the uh, remote works. I said, well, I just got two slides anyways, and he had a funny look on his face. And he spent a lot of time, but I thank him for getting that working. Uh, as you can see with the slide, I'm going to talk a little bit about today about drug trends here in Sheboygan County. And what occurs in Sheboygan County is occurring a lot throughout the state of Wisconsin. I've got some local st statistics for the last three years in the city of Plymouth from April of 2011 through the end of, of this year. And in the city of Plymouth, we've had 20, our 73 drug incidents just locally. That does not include any of the uh, drug arrests or drug incidents at our local MEG unit. If you're not sure or not familiar with the MEG unit, it's the Multi-Jurisdictional Drug Enforcement Group. And that's comprised of two uh, officers from the city of Sheboygan, two uh, sheriff's deputies, and one officer from the city of Plymouth that, work f that are assigned full-time to that unit. And they do some of the more complex uh, drug investigations in Sheboygan County, some of the, inf some of the statistics I also have from that unit. They also work hand-in-hand -hand with other adjoining counties, with the State Department of Justice, the Division of Criminal Investigation, and uh, DEA. So... I'm sure throughout the year in the press you've seen some news releases uh, concerning them. Part of the uh, MEG unit, when I talk to their MEG unit, their statistics, heroin over the last three years, especially in 2013 last year, has jumped almost tripled. Right now, since April of 2011, uh, to this point, heroin is, is the, the major drug that our MEG unit has been working with. Marijuana is still available, cocaine, but they've seen the biggest increase in the heroin use. Uh, some of our, the slides today, I'll point them out. Also, I obtained from the, uh, if you're familiar with the grant that the city of Sheboygan received on the heroin initiative. And we'll touch a little bit on that, but I'm gonna try to just talk about generalization and how some of the issues that's occurring for business people, it may be your employees, it's gonna surely be your customers and some of the things and uh, incident that recently happened in Plymouth uh, a week ago, Monday, kind of illustrates some of the, pro the problem with this heroin here. Uh, you know, you as business owners, uh, uh, family, friends, or, and adults, or your or parents, you're going to see some things in the community or some, see some things with your customers or family members. Some of the warning signs are visual indicators, and those visual indicators can be bloodshot eyes, impaired coordination, dilated, constricted eyes. Next area you want to watch are ch changes in daily patterns. Uh, maybe a person isn't sleeping anymore like they normally do, or they're sleeping at different times. Uh, eating habits have changed or not eating at all. And in the business setting, your workers, your employees, their productivity, is, uh, you know, you can see some change in their productivity or lack of it. Or maybe if you have a family member, school, or maybe it's uh, an employee that is also going to school, and their school productivity is, is dropping. An another area is financial problems. 
Uh, right now, talking to the, one of the Megunin investigators, if a person with heroin, it's about a $40 a day habit that uh, it's costing them, and they're using heroin about two or three times a day for an uh, for addict. Uh, and you can see some of the financial problems would be that they're always in a need for money behind on their bills. Maybe you're having a collection agency calling an, an employee, and you'll see some uh, taking checks. A lot of times you maybe have some uh, ripless checks that are coming through your business if you take them. And also you'll, you may see a lot of fraud on credit card fraud, that type of thing. Also, suspicious behavior is another indicator uh, where people are lying. You know, uh, they're, act, they're not telling you about different activities. They're doing things. They're telling you they're going to go one place and they're actually not going there. Or they're real secretive. You ask them what they've been doing, who some of their friends are or associates are. They aren't telling you anything. They're kind of uh, changing the subject and going in another direction. Another thing would be missing items within your home or business, missing cash, jewelry, maybe some prescription medication, that type of thing. Anything, television sets are a real hot item if they can get those, the newer television sets, they can, you know, they can sell those pretty quick for cash. And then once again, poor attendance at either work, school, maybe you have an employee that are, the person is calling sick a lot on a Monday or after a big event, something that's going on when, when they're using the uh, drugs. And you can also see that with put a lot of your uh, customers at times. And the problem, this is a, a slide, some of the information is from the uh, Heroin Initiative. It's a region, state, and county problem. In 2011, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Administration reported 8.3% increase of heroin for persons 12 or older in the Midwest. Interesting to talk to the uh, big unit investigators. The people that they're investigating and arresting, the average age is between, the heroin users is between 18 and 30 years old. Wisconsin's teens, 12 to 17, have tried heroin. That's been up 300% since 1999. This is some local survey from Sheboygan County. Uh, October of 2013, through the city of Sheboygan, did this survey. 1,354 res residents. 27 of the respondents personally knew someone who had been a victim of heroin. 27% knew someone who has uh, sought treatment for heroin, and 9% knew someone that had used heroin in the past 30 days. Uh, this slide here, a week ago, Monday, you probably saw an article in the paper where Marshall's gas station in the city of Plymouth, they had an attempted robbery, and that occurred about 7 o'clock at night, and uh, a party came in, he was wearing a hood, it was cold out, he had a t-shirt over his face, he had glasses, on, uh, sunglasses on, and, he wa and there was a one female employee in there, and what happened was, he came in, there were several other customers in there. I happened to talk to another resident of the city that said he was in there at the time but didn't see anything. But what this person did, he came in and he walked through the store, still kept his, uh, his face covered, looked up and down the aisles, looked at, waiting for the uh, customers to leave, walked in the bathroom, came back out, and then once everybody left, he was in there for about four or five minutes. And then he first went up and approached the, uh, the clerk and he came around the counter and then when he saw the, when he saw that the clerk was hitting the uh, panic button he left well we got some information actually through our mug, uh, meg unit investigator and then we were able to make by the next afternoon to get a search warrant and make an arrest um, i had also talked the party stepfather came in and, uh, two days later and i talked to him for a short time and he said he had been having problems with his stepson where he was uh, taking things from the house taking his checks and cashing his checks I asked him if he was going to have him prosecuted, and he wasn't going to have him prosecuted. But uh, it just goes to show he was—he needed money for his heroin. The, our investigator talked to him. He was pretty desperate. That clerk there was, in my opinion, was pretty lucky. Nothing happened to her. He had a knife; it was in his pocket. But how hard is it, how hard is it to choke somebody? So, those are some of the things that you know. If you have people that are in the community to say, "Well, it won't happen here in Sheboygan County," it's here. It's happening here. It can happen. You know, and it doesn't take long. Something like that, if it's a clerk or you're, or you're telling your employees, if that happens, first thing I would do, even with a suspicious party, dial 911, explain to the dispatcher that you have a suspicious party here. I would, I, and I'm sure I can speak for the city of Sheboygan and the Sheriff's Department, law enforcement would rather have you call on something like this, and this is suspicious, walking with a mask all the way through the store waiting for everybody to leave. We'd rather have you call than something you know, tragic happen. 
Heroin use leads to death, state of Wisconsin, 29 deaths between 2000 and 2007, 199 deaths in one year, 2012. I also, uh, one of our Meg Unit investigators said, everybody they talk to heroin, you ask them the same question. Are there any 50 year old heroin users or addicts? And everyone answers them and says no. And there's only one reason why they say no. None of them are here anymore, they're all dead. I think I touched on this a little earlier. Users are between 18 and 30 years old. And more than 70, and I guess the second statistic there, that's kind of, that's really alarming. More than 75% of those who try heroin once will, will use it again. Um, and I think the, the problem with heroin, it's, it's, a, it's a cheaper drug for them. It's, you know, it can, it, the effects last longer, they don't have to buy as much, but the sad part is, and the tragic part, look at how addicting it is. Uh, and when you have these people that are addicted, that's causing our, our crime to increase high violence, you have shoplifting issues, you have uh, internal thefts. The big thing with in internal thefts is that uh, do your due diligence when, when hiring uh, people. I have some uh, handouts over on the table if you'd like it. One of them is from the Wisconsin Department of Justice. It's, a, it's an online records check system. Some of you are probably aware of it. You can check on a person's criminal history. You might want to use it if you aren't now to check on your employees. I don't know if individually, if on your agencies, if you can do a drug test. I'm sure you all have uh, employees assistance program or access to them. But that's one of the things is, is doing a good background check on a person, credit check, those types of things. If they're, you know, if it's a bad credit, they're behind in bills. There might be something there that's causing this and a lot of addiction. Once again, when you're dealing with these individuals, they're all desperate. Something to share with your employees. I don't know what each and every business here is, what your uh, protocols are, but if a person comes in, give them what they want. Be a good witness. You know, take good notes, have paper and pencil, dial 911 and, and, and share that information with law enforcement. Law enforcement can't survive without everybody working together. The community, business community, citizens, schools. We all need each other's help here. And, I, and the next slide is, how can I help? Education leads to prevention. Foster open communication about the negative effects of addiction to prescriptions, drugs, and heroin. And you're already here. You're helping by being here. Uh, education, use your local law enforcement agency. Crime prevention, all the officers are trained in crime prevention. Invite them in to give talks to your group or to your uh, employees. If you're with a service organization, invite them in to give some uh, talks to those organizations. Even individually, we get a lot of calls from uh, parents, uh, teachers, uh, members of the business community. If they have a question, never feel afraid to call and, and ask an, uh, an officer a question. We're here. We're around 24-7. We're here for you to answer your questions, to give you advice, to give you some information to share. The other thing is you should, all businesses and even yourself, you should, you should practice good crime prevention techniques don't make yourself a victim. We were talking a little bit earlier at the table. I, when I'm walking through stores, be it grocery stores or Kohl's or whatever, I see a lot of purses open on, on a shopping cart or set down. You look around and the, per the owner of that purse is nowhere to be seen. Same thing for with, uh, with men uh, or anybody. Lock your items into uh, the trunk. Try not to make yourself a victim. And why should we talk about this in our community? Families are torn apart due to watching a loved one steal, lie, and slowly kill themselves through addiction. Business and property owners are victims of crime driven by addiction. It's, it's costing you employees, it's costing you money, it's costing everybody. So once again, everybody in this room and in the community, community we all need to, need to work together. Schools, law enforcement, business, uh, and other community leaders, local and at the state level, to, to work on not only uh, drug trend issues, but uh, good practices throughout uh, whatever business you're with and in our community. Um, and I have a slide with some information. You can uh, read that at uh, several different places. We have locally Sheboygan County, 
mental health. And the other thing is, you can always call your local law enforcement agency. We get calls, you know, just because you live in Plymouth doesn't mean you can't call Sheboygan and vice versa. If you live in a township, call the, call the agency that you feel most comfortable with. I also have another handout if you want to look at it or take one there on the corner here. And that's from the, you can join the Wisconsin Crime Alert Network. And they can either send you faxes or emails. That's, that's, I, th I believe that fee is $12 throughout the year, and that'll help with crime, uh, prevent crime, finding stolen property, locating misses, per, missing persons, etc. And there's a large group of membership in here. It's something that you, if you want to grab it or go online, both of these forms are available online, but I also have a passport over there. I think I'm out of time here. All right, now we're going to move into how is this affecting our local retailers. What we have going is some, some, uh, oh boy, right, right, right. I didn't get the <laughs> Okay, current crime trends in our local retailers. The heroin is feeding right into our shoplifting that we're seeing. The attitude that these addicts have, the users, the heroin users are, is a careless, I don't care, carefree attitude. Flat out just walking into, uh, especially our box stores along I-43 and the four, uh, Highway 41 corridor, I'll get into that in just a bit. But they are basically walking in, taking what they want with an attempt to walk out of the store, hopefully unnoticed, in the car and going and off the off. Okay, very blazing. Uh, they target expensive, high-end items, flat out walk out, and they may end up having tools. These people know what it is that they're doing. They'll carry the tools that they need because they know some of the um, uh, techniques used by retailers to curtail their shrinkage. Uh, and one of the things you will notice with the heroin users is they may appear to be under the influence of uh, controlled substance. Another trend that we're seeing is the organized crime, typically coming out of Milwaukee, teams of individuals using the I-43 corridor along with 41. They're making a big move what they're doing. They are actually going into the stores with a shopping list. They know specifically what it is that they want. They're bringing the tools that they need in order to accomplish their uh, task in uh, completing their list. They target those high-end items and they're going after multiple items. It's just not one and gone. It is as much as they can get and gone they go. Uh, what they're doing is once they get back to the Milwaukee area, is they're actually repackaging this stuff and going out into what is called the Great Market. Okay? All right, reactive strategies, news travels. If you have a retail store and you're not following, following your own policies, you are not enforcing the uh, shoplifting protocols that you have, or you're lax on your, uh, your uh, loss prevention program, news travels you will continue to be targeted. You can talk to a high school kid and find out, hey, what stores, what stores can you shop with from? They'll tell you. And once you get into the county jail, oh yeah, that's, that's quite an education. They basically don't find out anything. News <laughs> travels. So if you're last on your protocols, you can bet that you are going to end up being a target. We used to have a store in town that was so relaxed, this is no exaggeration, right straight from the loss prevention office that if their store policy was that if somebody was stopped for suspicion of shoplifting or stopped because they actually have a probable cause of shoplifting corporate would send a gift certificate for that individual for their store Whoa. now we wonder why they're not in business anymore <laughs> i won't mention any names but i'm sure through the process of elimination you can figure it out um, so with that being said, what are our strategies? Knowing that news travels out there, if you've got a last store, you're going to end up having a problem. Customer <coughs> service, number one. you got somebody that's in the store, and you suspect, we'll get into training in a bit, you suspect that somebody may be shoplifting. The best thing you can do is have your staff, may I help you? And they say, oh, no, I'm fine. Well, I tell you what. That's the time you start folding the, the clothes, you know, straightening out the hangers. You hang on that area long enough, you will discourage that person from wanting to hang around and they will leave. If you do that in a consistent manner, you will discourage that person from coming back. But it's got to be persistent, it's got to be continuous. Okay? 
uh, and prosecute. You stop somebody, legitimately stop somebody, you've got them dead to right to prosecute. Because if you don't, you lose world travel. Okay? Proactive strategies. Now, there is, um, I'm going to use Kohl's as an example. If you, uh, I'm sure everybody's been to Kohl's, but if you look at where that cash register is, where is it? Not very close to the exit, right? It would be a little closer, right? What you want to do is you want to locate your high shrinkage items as close to the register as possible. Now, you will end up having problems with corporate or uh, the actual manufacturer because they want it in a certain location, okay? But if you want to reduce your, your, your shrinkage, you're going to have to think outside the box and, okay, what's in the best interest here at the store? We're getting hammered on our shrinkage of this particular tank top. What can we do? Well, moving into the crash register closer to where there are staff available will help with that shrinkage. Now, training of the personnel, your, 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 your associates that are working the floor, this is critical. There's such a high turnover in, in retail that it's a constant effort. But you've got to teach them what to look for. Okay? One of the things to look for when it comes to, and I'm going to use those as an example, you look at that layout. Those that are shoplifting are going to steal within the, or conceal within, somewhere within the store, and they're going to use that back wall to get to the exit. And when they follow, think about it, picture Coles. If you follow that back wall, where does it lead you? Right to the exit. Unconfronted by any of the staff that is there at the cash register. Too far away from the exit. Okay? Look at Target. Target is a better setup. A little bit more difficult to use that, that back wall because you're going to have to go through a checkout. Okay? Keep that in mind. But it's constant training of your staff what to look for, okay? knowing what it is they're looking for, and then following the protocols that you have, you have set in place for prosecuting the individuals. I'm going to take that a step further that if you have somebody that caused a disturbance within your store, these teams come in. They will cause a distraction. These teams, this organized, this organized group. They will come in in teams. One of the things that they want to do is cause a distraction. I had a daughter that was really ticklish. And if I want to tickle her, I get her looking over here because my hand's wiggling, right? And then I come around and I tickle her this hand. Well, that's what they're doing. Well, it didn't take long for my daughter to figure out, oh, don't watch that hand. This is the hand. Watch. Okay? And that's what we want to do. We want to realize right off the get-go that if there's a disturbance over here or there's a distraction, we need to be watching what's going on over here. Okay? And it's a constant reinforcement of this stuff. And then what to do in the situation if there is a shoplifting? Are you hands-on? Are you hands-off? What are your protocols? There needs to be a clear understanding of what it is that the store wants their associates to do if you don't have loss prevention personnel. Okay? The store, this needs to be reinforced on a regular basis. The more you do this, you're sending the message to the organized crime and the users and your high school student, your mom, your... There's a wide range of people that are out there stealing. Okay? But you're sending the message to these folks, we're attentive to what's going on. If we catch up, we're going to make sure that you're arrested. And I would highly suggest that if your corporate office allows you and I know we've got this in the city of Sheboygan, you put, this, you put them on a criminal, criminal trespass warrant, which means for a designated period of time that you set, they are not allowed to come back onto the property, and if they do, they are arrested immediately for criminal trespass. Now, don't do what some stores do and keep them out for a week. Okay? You're not really sending a message. I, I say ban them. Now, you can evaluate it at the time. Situations are a little different, I get that. But make it meaningful enough that it has, it has an impact. News will travel. Uh, the other thing, require receipts for your returns. And signage. Use the signage. Uh, letting people know that you prosecute. Letting them know they're on camera. Okay? Proactive strategies continued. Anti-shoplifting technology. Boy, there's a lot of stuff out there. However, it can be defeated. And it's always attempted. Video surveillance is certainly one option to go. Anchoring the merchandise, this is less desirable because now it's bulky, it's inconvenient to the customer. You're dealing with the, with the, the cables and all this kind of stuff, but also it takes time in moving the merchandise. The time that it takes your associates to realign the store and move things around, it's very 
they're time consuming. The best combination you have is to take an alarm system along with the closed circuit TV. In combination of those two, you can help make an impact on your shrinkage. Okay? So those are some of the proactive strategies. Um, I'm running out of time. I've got this gifted cab. I can really talk a long time on this stuff. Uh, one other thing I want to add before I'm done is communication. It was suggested by the chief uh, to get involved with some of these groups out here with information sharing, but also locally. There are retailers that meet on a regular basis, and you can share this information with each other, who to look for. You can share photos. As long as it doesn't leave the store, you can share photos of suspects. Just don't be putting it out there, posting it out there for the whole world to see. No, it's got to be kept within the office area. But let your associates know who are, who is your threat. But now we've got this organized crime that's working I-43 and 41. All right. If you get a phone call from um, Grafton and say that, hey, such and such is on their way up, this is the time that you can put your people into action. Okay? There is absolutely nothing wrong with having store personnel or your loss prevention officer right out there at the entrance looking for the person that you know is coming. Send that message right off the get go. Oh, I've been waiting for you. Okay? <laughs> Send that message. Deter that person or that group from wanting to come back to your store. Make it a hard target. Now, if you've got that organized group and they're inside your store, they're causing a problem, there is nothing, as she said, call us. We want to know who these people are, too. There's nothing wrong with that, but I can't guarantee that you're going to get an officer there ready to split. But by the mere, okay, so they end up leaving the store by the time we get there. But they're passing that squad car as they're leaving. They know, oh my gosh, they call the cops. You're still sending the message that the, the, the management there, the loss prevention team, the store clerk, your associate, somebody call. And that's where you, that's raising a red flag for that. Hmm, do we really want to go back to the store? Well, I'll tell you what, we'll find another target. So communication amongst the stores, working together, who are your threats? What is their timeline? Hey, they're on their way. If you got hit, if you're a full store and you just got hit or you just saw a suspect and you know that they're making that round, make that call to Green Bay. Matter to walk, hey, just to let you know, so-and-so was just here. They're, they may be on their way. You only look out for Okay? All right. I'm sure I've exhausted my time. <laughs> Greeted. 
And that discouraged them right off the get-go. Then you went over to the community bank. So when they do walk into a financial institution, they're looking for the attentiveness of the personnel. Are they making the eye contact? Are they greeting? They're looking for the cameras. Okay? Now, you always give everything up. Okay? No matter what. It's your protocol. You make the decision. Your financial institution makes the call when you're going to push that button that activates the panic alarm. Okay? However, I can't speak enough about actually going through a mock robbery with your staff. I have seen where, because on an annual basis, you are required to do robber training, correct? Every financial institution. Okay? With that being said, when the Sheboygan Police Department started doing training with that mock robbery for financial institutions, I saw this myself. Every time I went into a financial institution for the first time, they've all been trained on what to do. However, when it came to the actual test, you're kind of like, oh, no. <laughs> robbery occurred, the bad guy, he shot some rounds off. We even got somebody that decided they were going to be uh, a hero and make eye contact with the guy, totally violating and, and basically going against what the orders of the bad guy were. I actually instructed him, shoot him. If you got a guy that is making, you know, making that eye contact and you told him to get on the ground and he's eye gigging, you shoot him because that's what's going to end up happening. Make an example of it. And then you get got people that are just... But I'll tell you what, when I went in the second time, everybody was boom, 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 boom. They knew what to do. There was no hesitation. Everything went into motion. I got a county board meeting. Uh, next month, we are actually going to do this. We're going to prepare for an active shooter situation. We're going to prepare the county board. I'm going to find out if anybody got any medical conditions or anything like that. I need to be aware. Because in February, you're going to be put to the test. You're going to be taught what to do, okay? And you're going to do it. Because I don't want people pausing and thinking if it was when it really happens without having that role play. So there's something to be said about actually physically doing the role playing of actual burglaries. It pays off. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Sorry, Good afternoon, everybody. Um, first thing that I want to touch on is just share with you some of the ongoing and emerging issues in law enforcement. So once a month, all the, the chiefs and the sheriff within the county get together. We have a state organization that uh, Chief Riffle is currently the um, president of. And then we have a, a Wisconsin police executive group that I'm the current chair of that's of cities 20,000 and over, and then of course national groups. And one of the interesting things is every, no matter if it's at the county level meeting or at one of the national meeting, it's the same issues that are being talked about across all segments here. And so Jeff talked a little bit about the rise in the heroin issue, really a crisis throughout the entire country, not just here. Um, one of the big issues that keeps coming up that if you read the papers is the uh, lack of services to mental, people with mental health issues and how that bleeds over into everything else, um, corrections, law enforcement, really it's a big problem. Um, lots of issues with implementing emerging technologies, both from um, the positive side, understanding what's there, but then also, as you read in the paper, a lot of the privacy issues that come up. So. Law enforcement's use of um, cameras in the cars and now um, the emergence of body-worn video in, by a lot of law enforcement personnel. Um, cities putting up surveillance cameras downtown. Cities um, either getting access through investigation or cooperatively to all the surveillance cameras that, that businesses are putting up um, to protect themselves. Um, License plate readers, there's been a lot of talk about that in, in the news. Uh, big data, uh, afraid of government overstepping. But like any business, if we want to try to be effective and maximize what we have um, in this type of economic situation where, where budgets are tight and we're cutting personnel and we're trying to be more effective, it's important that we take advantage of a lot of those technologies to use them too. So lots of interesting things going on there. One of the big topics for the last um, several years um, revolves around employee wellness and resiliency. So 
wellness, just like you would deal with it as a business to try to reduce um, your health care costs, and we would deal with as a city, but also building up resilience so that the officers who are exposed to ongoing trauma all the time understand the effect that it can have on you and the things to do to reduce that so we're not paying those bills and, and getting people going off on disability and dealing with that. So uh, understanding what systems we have to put in place to protect ourselves from that. One of the big things over the last couple of years is the movement within the criminal justice system um, to evidence-based practices. So the idea that um, we just don't do something and, and not pay attention to, to the results, but actually gather data, measure how we're doing, and use research-based uh, research um, methodologies to ensure that the, the conclusions that we're coming to about whether or not what we're doing is successful um, has something to back it up. And then when we find something that's working, to share it throughout um, the community so other law enforcement agencies can, can use it and it becomes a base of knowledge that everybody has. So now the next thing that I want to talk about, part of it is, is it really about using some of those evidence-based practices to build a better system. Um, lots, of, lots of issues with, within the criminal justice system. Um, that need to be improved, including um, disparate data systems. One of the areas that we're really lucky is that in Sheboygan County, we're all on the same records management system so that if something happens in Plymouth, we have access to the information and the data and we can share it and, and notice some of those trends earlier. But um, as a criminal justice system as a whole, that's really a problem in that throughout the state, very few of us have access to each other's data, so we have to try to build interfaces to be able to run queries and get to some of that. And it's really the same on a national level, where if we all had one records management system that we could share, it would be a lot more effective for some of these people that are moving across the country or changing communities and doing those types of things. So what I wanted to talk about is some of the work that we're doing um, on the reentry issue, so reintegrating people that have um, been incarcerated back into the community. And I thought that would be timely due to the fact that a lot of the chamber events that I come to, a, a lot of the talk and focus is on the shortage of workers and the shortage of workers with skills. So how do we build a safer community, reduce crime, and reduce recidivism if we're operating on the, on the belief that the way to deal with criminals is really to lock them up and punish them. You know, at some point we have to understand that it costs a lot of money to lock people up and if they're getting out at some time and we're not sure that they have um, the skills and the support to be successful, what's going to end up happening is they're just going to go back into the life of crime that they were already in so we're back in that, that same uh, Position. So the idea here is really is again to understand some of the information out there. So that about eight percent of the population commits eighty percent of the crime, and then out of that group, there's still a whole scale here where about twenty percent of the people are are essentially one-time criminals. So very low risk involved there. You have another eight percent there that are chronic offenders that. It doesn't matter to, to a large degree what's going to happen. They're going to be in the system. And, and then you have that whole middle group there that is really um, what we would call um, medium risk but high needs. So they have some kind of issues that we really need to address. And if we don't address those issues, that causes the, the, the risk to go up. So we're talking about, again, um, drug and alcohol abuse problems, um, low educational attainment, and antisocial cognition, so base, basic things that if we supervise them correctly and provide programming for the needs, hopefully we can get them into a position where they can transition into a, a normal lifestyle where they're not trying to prey on everybody else. So as a system in the county, we're working on some of these things. Um, we have a couple different groups that, that that work together to try to get everybody on board and moving in the same direction. Um, there's a criminal justice advisory group that myself, the sheriff, the judges, health and human services, the defense attorneys, district attorney, everybody sits on it and, and is working on it. And, and then when we talk about this, it's really happening at two different levels. So the local level, in, 
through the county jail, uh, the county detention center, and then on the, at the state level with um, the Department of Corrections, so the prisons and uh, community corrections, so probation and parole. The first step is trying to identify screening tools and processes. And so what the screening tools really do is, is help us to measure risk. And again, that set scale that we're talking about is this group is really first time offenders, very low risk um, because of other factors. They, they they're, have stable jobs, they're married and have families that they're supporting, they have a good support network. There's very low risk that they're really gonna offend. We really have to find them guilty and, and put them in a low low risk supervision program and, and not waste a lot of money on them. We have another um, group, as I mentioned, that, that's high risk chronic offenders. They need to get locked up and stay there. And then there's the, this other group that we need to then do, use our assessment tools and processes to really try to find out what those needs are and make sure that those needs are being met. At the local level, again, two levels here that we're talking about. We're talking about people in a predispositional um, stance, so somebody that's essentially been accused of a crime but is awaiting trial or, or a plea or whatever it might be. And in those cases, we have something that's called bail that usually a bail is set on somebody. The purpose for that bail is for twofold. Number one, to get them to show up at court, and then two, to make sure that to reduce the risk so that there's not harm to the community. So I identify, is this somebody that needs to stay in jail or is this somebody that needs to go out? And so we need to be making good decisions about what people's risk are. So again, we're not spending all kinds of money to keep the wrong people in the detention center. So it doesn't make any sense for somebody who is arrested on a, a second or third time OWI to keep them in the county jail for, for a period of time before they're found guilty if they have a full-time job that they're gonna lose because they stay there and they have a family that they're supporting that they're not gonna be able to support. We're really only making it worse. We have other tools that we're using to ensure that, that they are showing up at court and then that they're following their bail conditions, which most of the time means no contact with, with alcohol and things like that. So using um, new technology such as ankle bracelets that can monitor um, the perspiration on their skin to determine if, if they are using alcohol and if they are to send a signal to the detention center that tells us that they're violating the bail so that we can send somebody there to um, enforce it. Um, using day reporting centers to, to get people out of the detention center, again, who have jobs and have those things going on, that we can still monitor them daily or weekly, give them drug tests, whatever it, it might be needed, so that we're not spending all the time keeping them there. Um, the second issue is, is after disposition, so somebody that's been sentenced, again, what's the most effective way to sentence them, and then what's gonna happen when that sentence is over. So if they're in the detention center, it's usually less than a year that they're gonna be locked up. So we know in the near future, they're gonna be getting out, and we have to figure out what to do with them so that they're, they're successful. So um, determining if they have educational needs and providing that education right now through LTC and trying to expand some of that, trying to um, line up vocational services so that they are capable of, of finding employment if they don't have it, uh, making sure that we have the capacity to provide the um, AODA needs that are out there and not just putting on somebody on probation with a condition that, that they get drug counseling and we don't have access to it for them. So lining up all of those support services so that we can get them out if they don't have the skills and the support to have jobs and do that. So really, those are many of the things that we're doing. And one of the reasons I, I mention it is because you're the business community and here comes the contradiction. Earlier we told you make sure that you're doing checks on everybody and don't be hiring the wrong people. And now I'm standing up here telling you some of these people get to the point in their life where they're ready to make a change and we gotta have people that are willing to take a chance on them with the knowledge of what their situation is and then 
with us providing a partnership um, through law enforcement, corrections, and the other services that we set up so that when they start falling off the wagon or going sideways, you have somebody that you can reach out and say, I took a chance on this person, they're starting to go, something's going to happen bad here and we can get that support network in to keep them going straight so that we can reduce crime and the recidivism throughout our community. Thanks. Now, if I could invite you three up to the uh, table so that we could shoot you easier. Just kidding. <laughs> so we can actually ask you guys questions. That'd be awesome. Thank you. Um, while they're getting situated, I'd also like to thank Prevea for sponsoring our meals again. Um, they always are so generous with us, so thank you, Prevea. And a great big round of thanks um, to The Bull, because this is our first uh, program out at The Bull, and they've done a lovely job. I think the meal, everybody would agree the meal was delightful, and the, the situation, the setup is really very welcoming. So thank you very much to The Bull. And... We're going to open the floor to questions. Yes. We read a lot about people being uh, convicted of burglary. We don't read, a, I don't read a lot about what they, they burglarize, they, they steal TVs, they get rid of those TVs. Or receiving that TV and doing whatever they do with it. And, and I'm not a law enforcement to do the job. What that tells me is that that part is very difficult. Can someone describe what happens with that TV when the addict sells it? There, there's markets out there just like, like there's a market for any kind of product. So those markets might vary. Some of what we would commonly see is, is what's popular now would be the game systems. So a Wii, an Xbox, something like that. The first thing that we do is go to resellers within the community and check them. And again, we're talking about uh, making gas systems to, to make us more uh, effective. So one of the programs that we use um, is written by uh, a Green Bay police officers. It's, it's called uh, New Purse. Don't ask me what it stands for at this point, but it, it's a data entry system. So if we have items that are reported to us as stolen, uh, they get entered into, into New Purse so that retailers can sign up for it and go on there and look and see what's, what's stolen. And then the retailers, as part of city ordinances or county ordinances, are also required to enter that in, into there. So we can assign an officer or a detective to check periodically. Because if it's stolen in Chihuahua, a lot of the dumb criminals will go to some of our places, game stop, um, right up at Target here and some of those places, and, and, and sell it for 80 bucks if they pay But some of the smarter ones or more organized ones aren't going to sell up here. They're going to take it to Green Bay, they're going to take it to Eau Claire. And this lets us then um, marry that out. Same thing with um, scrap dealers. So we have a scrap dealer system where they report it to Gray with the most students turn it in and find out where they turn it in. So actually, technology in that way has really helped us uh, move a lot faster on these things. But there's also a secondary market where they're selling it. To, to drug dealers who are using it in, in their houses or their own houses or something like that. And there's also, also Craigslist. You can check a lot of things on Craigslist. And some of these people, they're desperate for money. A couple of days or the next day, they'll go right back to the store if they steal a uh, TV and want to return it and get some money back on it. You know, once again, Sheriff Creevy's presentation require uh, uh, sales. I would show something that is based on our experience in the past, our mind is ask, you know, I know a lot of corporates don't like to do it, is ask for a current photo identification. Because we've had it in the past where people during the holiday season, they get their cars broken into, there's a receipt in there, they go back to the store, they say, I decided not to take this. This is years ago, long before the credit cards are used more now, more so now. Cash, they get the cash back, they do a slip of paper and a pen to put their name and address down, they sign it, well, it's all fictitious. Well, you know, and I will, I'm not in that. In the, in, in the business, I know it's sometimes it's a, it's a burden. It's easier to get uh, to return things, but that's just some of the issues there. But there's a market for this. They'll even send these people out with specific things to pick up in these stores. That's why you can see.
see a lot of your, your larger stores, everything's work done or locked up. I noticed our local Walmart store used to have all the uh, cell phones. Everything's all locked up now. What about uh, paper money? We accept a lot of people pay their bills with paper, um, you know, other than a little counterfeit pen we have. Is there anything I should be doing as a service to the banks or the people bringing money? Is that a big thing anymore? Or? I, I would say, I would suggest that you keep up with the, the, the currency and the changes in the currency. Um, there's a new hundred dollar bill out right. and there's security measures in there. And I would make sure that uh, the staff knows what are those security um, things within each of the bills and, and each one's a little different. Uh, and I would not overlook those either because there's some pretty good stuff out there with today's uh, Good printers and computers, things of that nature. They're 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 putting out some pretty good counterfeit. So you want to not depend just on that marker. I would suggest that you also understand the characteristics and those security measures in each one of them. And, and some of them they, they've got that thread that goes through that you can't see uh, without holding up to a light. There's microfibers in there that they're not they're not put in by a mark by a mark or anything. They are actually microfibers that if you took your fingernail, you can actually remove them. Uh, there's various things that you can look for. To Where do you get that cheat sheet then, so to speak? Oh, you get the bank? The Treasury it's Department. The, and, yeah, yeah, Federal Reserve has a really nice brochure. Okay. Check with your bank and see if they have those brochures available. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and what the sheriff says is you can't rely on just the, the feel or, or that. Last year um, in Sheboygan, got a bag in the federal court to also keep in mind that much like um, people trying to buy alcohol or tobacco uh, and they're underage, they'll target the new associate or the young employee, much like passing. The, the busier that line is or the busier that person is, the more likely they're going to miss something. The pressure is on to get people through because customers are getting anxious and stuff. That is when you've got to be the most cautious because that's when they're going to try to slip this stuff. Uh, let's pretend that there's a robbery of some sort at the corner of Eighth and Dealey. With all of the neighborhood protection programs and the neighborhood policing and things like that, is there a way, if, if, if something happens at a location, do you have a way of getting information out to the residents in that area to, to put them on alert for activity, just to make sure you don't lock your doors and things like that? We have a system called Nixle. So what you would do is go to the Sheboygan Police Department website, sheboyganpolice.com. You can sign up, and then if you sign up, then we can send out alerts, press releases, information about neighborhood meetings. You get to select if you want it sent out as a text message on your phone, if you want to email, whatever. So we're constantly sending that out. It's a good way to, to get information. Is that Sheboygan only? It's for the city of Sheboygan. This Wisconsin Crime um, Alert Network that Jeff talked about a little bit is, is a statewide system where some of these things that we're talking about where there's organized crews targeting businesses, they'll send out alerts throughout the whole state about what's going on so that you can get that information. So that's subject to what we're trying to use. Same thing. Uh, we haven't developed the next next hell yet. Uh, we had a big project within the village of Harvest Grove, anyway from Harvest Grove. Uh, we had a, done a door-to-door -door there uh, where the problem was thefts, automobile uh, theft, uh, that what we had decided to do for the uh, community or the village of Towers Grove was build a database on emails. And we are going to use that as a way to communicate in an event that had occurred and getting that out to the village. Now each one's going to be a little different that, um, and how, how well it's received, but in the village of Towers Grove, uh, I don't think we got a, a single denial in providing an email. Now, right now, our staff is working on uh, putting together the, the emails and being able to get information out uh, via email. Nextel is nice because you can get that, that, that alert right over your phone. Uh, it's getting people to buy into it, though, and, and actually sign up for it. So I encourage you to do it because it is. And, and I would add one, one other thing because the mayor would. 
yell at me if I get into it. In the city, we're, we're, the mayor's leading uh, an initiative to push out an application called Nextdoor. So it's a social media application to connect neighbors, and government pushes one way on it. So you have to be verified as living in the neighborhood or having a business in the neighborhood um, to participate, and then you get to talk to all your neighbors about what's going on, ask questions, look for advice, and then if government wants to push out information, we can push the information one way to so you can get information that way. Since our audience here is relatively small, and you've said some pretty valuable things, uh, we'd like to make sure that we can get that information out to the, to the chamber world anyway, through our funding monitor. So if there's things that we should know about that are the, the missing audience, needs to know, okay, they appreciate having all of those links and things like that. A couple other things I would just mention that one of the things that John sent is um, for higher level I issues with cybercrime, um, the FBI is going to be at LTC on January 21st um, talking about intellectual property and cybercrime and, and some of those things that would be a little important question. And then for some of the issues that I was talking about, I brought some information on fidelity bonding. Uh, so that's a program that the state legislator put together so that if you want to take a chance on, on somebody that has a criminal record, um, you can get free bonding on them for six months, um, up to $25,000, so if they end up um, needing to protect them for trying to help them out, so you have some coverage on that. And to get back to your, to your question, what we've done a couple times in Plymouth, a smaller geographical area, we had several times this year we had issues where during the evening hours, uh, individuals were entering cars, stealing what they can, or going in garages. It was, you know, a small area. We shared that information on the city's webpage, Facebook, but we did one thing. We created our, our own brochures and uh, advising people lock their doors, lock their garage, and lock their vehicles. And we actually had, when the officers had time, we went into those neighborhoods, went door to door, made contact. If nobody was there, we, we left the flyer on the door. If there was contact, we said, if you have the opportunity, share this information with your neighbor, call your neighbor. You know, we have the luxury of a smaller neighborhood, so we, we still do some of those things because a lot of times we can't reach uh, a lot of the population through uh, emails and those types of things. Everybody always got their own cell phones. That like it used to be years ago. So, but that's some of the things that okay. we do to help share some and get that information out. Thanks. And just so everybody knows, the next door program works sort of like a Facebook page. Um, so you can join as a business in your neighborhood, you can also join as an individual in the neighborhood you live in. It's, it's a very nice um, setup. Um, our business and ourselves personally and our family have been a part of that for over a year now, and it's been very helpful. Um, Dan, do you still have a question? Oh, yes, I'm wondering, with the retail theft situation, the safety of employees, is that true that the situation changes drastically if that person gets into the parking lot and or a waiting vehicle? As far as up in the ante, judicial situations, all of these, does that change quite a bit once they are able to get out of the store? Well, it, the, the potential of it becoming violent uh, is definitely there. Uh, most often, they want to be able to escape. Uh, it's when you start going hands-on that it's extremely uh, elevates the, the possibility of a hands-on possible injury. They just want to get out of there. So I would say that the potential of a shoplifter at any time uh, getting violent <coughs> is there. Uh, each store should have their own policy on how it is that they handle those types of situations. We can't dic that dictate that to you. Um, but nevertheless, that's the time that you call law enforcement. And if you got a no hands-on policy that you're, you're not going to bring them to law enforcement when they start getting combative like that, which I'm fine with, then the person needs to be attentive enough to get the description of the individual, the car that they're getting into, the license plate number, the direction that they're traveling, and give us that information so that we can uh, end up hopefully locating them nearby or at least having a license plate number get a registered order in that. Um, I'd once again like to thank um, Sheriff Preby and Chief Demog 
Domogowski and Tauchuk from for coming to talk with us today. Um, if you have a few seconds after the meeting, um, please feel free to step up here and take uh, take advantage of the pa pamphlets and information that they gave you, um, and take a few seconds to talk to them. Thank you again, gentlemen.